Well, welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Um, today was going to be the continuation of our acrylic fest um, because I wanted to go back to using a standard head, standard drive system, well, standard ish because if you remember. I've changed my belt round so technically it's now a flexible rack and pinion system as opposed to a belt drive system. Yeah I know it looks like a belt drive but the principle of it now is that of a, of a rack and pinion. We've taken this off and rather than put my hastily manufactured adjustable head bracket I've decided to replace that with a, a a slightly better quality now. I've used a piece of uh, aluminium extrusion, L-shaped aluminium extrusion, which I think started off at about three by one or three by one and a half. And I have machined it in two pieces, um, one to make a back plate, and I've left this corner on the back plate here so that it gives me a register to slide this piece up and down to keep the upright adjustment of the head in a perfectly vertical plane and this one again the plan was I was going to stick this back on here to mount the existing head on it and then I thought you know what in the same way that I didn't like the mirrors in the corner of this machine I really don't like this mirror mounting system on here the beam is not going in on centre. This whole design with its four, four millimetre hole nozzle in the end, everything about it is okay, but from what experiments I've done, I think I could design something much better than this. So that's what I'm in the process of doing. So today I'm going to show you my prototype head design. Um, you're not going to believe this when I say that I'm making it from acrylic. You probably will because I'm an acrylic-holic. That's not entirely true. What you really ought to see is my stock of acrylic there <laughs> um, that I've acquired. All of it for free. So yeah, I have got good reason to make everything that I construct in acrylic. Now on this occasion um, you can see that I'm using this material here which is extruded material. Um, I'm using extruded material because it's got a better tolerance and because I've got all sorts of slots and links in here which I need fairly accurately manufactured I've chosen to use XT material. The boring bit is taking the, uh, the plastic film off. This is the only guaranteed way to get absolutely perfect surface finish. The reason I haven't taken the film off this yet is because I've got to tap these two holes in the corner here, M4. This is one of the most useful pieces of kit in my workshop I think. I've got an M4 tap in here and this is just perfect for... putting a tapped hole in. It's a difficult job made simple. We'll put that one down first and they're both the same so either will do and then we'll choose this piece with all the holes in it. Now this is quite important that you put this in the right way round because you can put it in that way round or you can put it in that way round. The problem is this bracket here has to fit these holes and the bracket only lines up with the holes that way round, like that. We've got a similar situation with this next piece, which is the one we've just put the two tapped holes in. The two holes in the corner need to sit towards the top. Whoops, there we go. So they need to sit on this top corner here. And then we'll put these little brackets in, these little C-shaped brackets. So there we go, we've got our C-shaped brackets in there now. And now we'll put this other piece on top. 
and I suggest you put it on the top item there first and then locate these other pieces in it. Like that. And that's all nicely assembled together. Now you should be able to slide that over the edge of the table and pick it up and clamp it together like that with your fingers. Because what we then need is this piece. And you'll see that this sits neatly on there like that. Now we're going to glue that now. We're going to glue the bottom on first and to do that I've got one of my compound lens cones and there's just enough of glue in there at the moment for me to run along the edge there, that edge there and that edge there. Now I'm doing this on this cone here so that I can apply a little bit of downward pressure to make sure that it sits nice and tight all around this bottom joint line while the glue is drying. It takes 15, 30 seconds maybe, just enough to hold it together. And once it's held together like that, you're safe. We need more glue on than just around that bottom edge. So what we can now do, is we can start applying glue particularly to this top corner here, this top edge. Now basically with all the tongues in that that there is in, are in there, these pieces here are still quite snug in there. But I'm still going to put a little bead of glue along the back edge of each one of those. And then we're going to turn it down on its face. And we've got this piece here which has got matching holes for these two holes here. Now these fill up the space in the back here and provide thickness for me to tap two more M4 holes in here, put a few blobs of glue around the edges here and in the back and drop this on and make sure that it lines up with the bottom. Okay now these are the pieces that we've got left and while we're waiting for this one to dry nice and solid um, we might as well have a go at putting these together. Now, you'll find that there are two items there that look fairly similar to each other, one with a hole in and one without a hole in. Now, what I suggest you do is to line it up very neatly along the edges, top and bottom, with your fingers. You might even want to sit it on a surface and push them together to get them flat along the bottom edge and feel that they look smooth along that side edge there. Now clamp it hard in the middle at the bottom there and then along this edge here if you just put a little bead of glue in there you'll see the glue run down the inside of the two faces. The capillary action takes the glue in there. Hold it and clamp it together. Then you can go to the bottom edge and you can put a little bead of glue along the bottom edge as well. You can see the glue running across the inside face there, so we can leave that aside to dry. Now we also need a second setting piece for beam alignment, which is what this big hole is for. And we're going to put this solid square plate, or rectangular plate, underneath it. Now that square plate, or that rectangular plate, only fits one way. So again, what you need to do is to hold it all nicely clamped upright, push the edges together along the bottom edge there and keep the side edges nicely in line with each other. And clamp it hard with your finger at the bottom edge here. Okay, and then do the same thing again. Put some glue along the edge. Try not to get glue on your fingers, otherwise your fingers will get stuck to the job and that looks as though the glue has already run round the bottom here anyway and round here so there's enough glue in there to hold all that together so we can leave that aside now and then finally we've got these two pieces here which are left bottom edge line up the sides with your finger and clamp one corner okay now put some glue just on that edge there and then we do the same on the other corner 
and there we go we've used up all the pieces okay now I've already made a prototype which I'm just going to disassemble because one of the things I want to use from this Mark 1 is the um, lens is the mirror assembly this is one of the best mirror adjusting systems that I've come across now most mirror systems that you find um, are adjusted with three screws now you either have one screw here one screw here and one screw at the top which is what they have on the head of every machine that I've ever looked at now we have a much better system here inside the light blade machine which is a much more logical system what I'd almost like to call door hinges because look we've got a pivot point a pivot line like a door hinge across the bottom here and when you adjust this one the mirror tips up and down and when we want to tip the mirror the other way we've got a we've got a pivot point or a hinge across these two so when we adjust this one the mirror tips this way we don't get any compound angles involved whether I move this way or this way I'm not actually touching that one because I can adjust this one to get my up and down and I can adjust this one to get my left to right I don't need to touch that one what I've done in that corner the fixed pivot point corner I've just put a straightforward M3 screwed in there with an M3 tapped hole it's a fairly low profile pan head screw which gives me about a millimeter to just over a millimeter thickness there now the other thing that I didn't show you was my rather unconventional but actually who's got a special tool for taking these mirrors out with two pins on it everybody will have an allen key I'm dropping the mirror in clamping it against the front face and just tightening up a couple of allen screws which will drive the bottom corner and clamp it there there and there so we've basically got three point clamping on this mirror it's not going to come out now this mirror block is made up of two pieces I've got a piece of six millimeter acrylic here and a piece of 1.7 or 1.6 thick acrylic on the front so there again is a sandwich of two pieces of acrylic that I've glued together the front one is slightly smaller diameter than the back one so we've got about a 23 millimeter diameter mirror on there okay now normally the mirror as you've seen if you look at your head is mounted outside like this because it's very convenient this is basically a pan head screw which is an M3 pan head which has been screwed into the corner here tapped into the corner and screwed in so that acts as a fixed pivot point and here are my springs right close against the pivot point so that sits inside there like that inside you'll note not outside all will become clear why I want to do that in a minute when I've assembled it in here I've got a couple of hexagon, hexagonal slots in the two millimeter material so there's a couple of nuts sitting in there M3 nuts okay so we put the M3 nuts in hold it with your finger line the holes up on this side with those holes underneath there and then we've got an M3 screw with a spring which passes through the holes and you will be able to put compression on the spring and tighten it up into the nut like that it's pretty simple you don't need too much compression on the springs it takes quite a lot to move those springs okay now I've made the mirror a fairly snug fit inside here so that it can't wander around and of course the great advantage now is look I can see I can touch 
I can feel, I can clean, I can do anything I like with that mirror now because it's not hidden away. It's exactly the same as the other mirrors on the machine, completely accessible. Now, we've got two choices from here onwards. I've got these very long, which I'd cut down, M4 plastic screws, which we could put in there and use as adjusting screws. Hey, how often do you adjust this mirror? Very rarely. So what I've opted for, again, is grub screws. I regard this as a temporary knob, a temporary handle. And I've got just as fine adjustment on here as I have with a knob. So we're going to put two grub screws in there. And what we do, we set the gap here so that it's the same as the gap set by the screw head. And that's about a millimetre to a, about around about a millimetre. So we set the front screw with a millimetre gap across there and we set this back screw and we can see what's going on. We can set that from the back here again to about a millimetre clearance. Now note there's also that I can get in there to remove my mirror and I can get in here to remove my mirror as well. I can remove my mirror by just undoing these two screws and the mirror pops out the back here. We've got one more little fitting task to do and that is we've got to fit this. Now there is a recess here between this bottom plate which is the reference and I've made a couple of small projections here so that this will locate on here and allow me to produce nice horizontal movement when I want to adjust the head. The only thing is, at the moment, I've made it probably about a quarter of a mil too small and it doesn't fit in there snugly. So what I have to do is just gently take a small amount off each one of these sides. Now the beauty of this is, because I've got these two points here a long way apart, there's no twist on it. It moves along lovely and smoothly and I get nice, even, horizontal movement. Now the only thing that we haven't done at the moment, and we've got to go back to the bench press, and we've got to tap M4 holes here and here. I can hear you guys saying, that bloke is a nutter. Fancy making a head out of acrylic. It's very cheap for me to make a prototype and test it out of acrylic. Eventually, if this is successful, I might even decide to invest in making it in lightweight anodized aluminium. Okay, so I've now made this little casing with a mirror in it. Where's my lens? Where am I gonna fix my lens? How am I gonna get adjustment? Well, I happen to have on my machine an adjustable table. If you don't have an adjustable table, then I'm afraid you're stuffed. This won't work for you. And here I have my pièce de résistance. It's a set of lenses and tubes that are already manufactured with the lenses in the back. Now the lenses are only held in with an O-ring. Oh my goodness me, that sounds terrible. What happens if they blow out with the air pressure inside? Well, we'll deal with that in a minute. I've even managed to get my high definition lens to fit into this as well. So we can go from HD all the way up to two and a half inch lens in that little assembly there. Okay, now that we've built the head, <clears throat> we've put this plate on here and the first thing we had to do was to check that it was square to the table. That means we don't have to check that the head is actually square because we know that if the bracket's square, everything has been machined square to the bracket. So you can see that it slides up against, against this reference edge and will stay square. Well, I've got the head mounted on the bracket now. Um, the only thing I've got to do is put the mirror in and, and here's my copper mirror out of the other head. I'm just going to polish it up. Now there was the merest amount of oxidation on there after several months of use but now it's, it's back to pristine condition with what? 10 seconds of polishing? That's literally all I did just so I don't want to put my fingers on it. Just pop that in there like that. We just clamp it in, nice and solidly clamped in there.
The head at the moment is loose because I haven't set the head up. It's loose this way and it's about, it's sitting towards one end of the slot in that direction. Now I've got some special aids to help me set up this head because it's my design and I've designed it with simplicity of setting in mind as well as simplicity of use. I can put a small target into that piece of acrylic there, that little pocket, and I can slip that into some notches that are on the front of the head there, like that. So that gives me a correct aiming point for my beam. Now, we've got no idea where this mirror two is going to point to, so to be safe, we'll take a piece of paper, just move this back a bit because remember we've already set Y so it doesn't matter where we are now backwards and forwards on the machine that's already set so I can pop that there in front of the head and do a pulse oh look it's way up here let's compare that to the height of the head it's way up here so we need to come down a long way to get it back onto centre getting better nearly on the target centre that's not far out now so let's locate it on something here keep your fingers well out the way there we go now what I've got to do is to see where it is in this other direction, this way. It's just about on target at the top right. Okay, so now I can tweak it a little bit further down and I can pull it a little bit further across and we can test it now on the target pulse. We're still close to the top, push it down a bit more and a bit more. There we go. Now that's reasonably close to centre. All we've done now is to get the beam approximately in line. That's not the start of the test as I indicated to you the first time round. So this is a sighting beam. Now we've put a target in and we'll start the proper alignment test for mirror two and we drive this all the way back as close as we can to mirror number two. Right we've just captured that in there with a little piece of tape and now we'll do a, a target burn. Oh dear that's a long way up isn't it? Now this is one of the reasons why I've adjusted and made my head fully adjustable. This head adjusts in and out this way and it adjusts up and down this way for the very reason that you've just seen. My target is so high that I need to raise the head. And we'll do another test. Still could do with coming up a bit more. Too high now, just let it down a shade. Note, I've put the target onto the beam centre. I haven't done any adjustment to the beam at the moment. Now we'll start from square one. We'll produce what I call a target burn, which should technically be pretty close to centre, as you can see. All right, slightly, need to adjust it slightly, but we don't have to worry at the moment. So we now go to the other end of the stroke, and you can see we're right at the far end of the machine now, and we'll see how good our second mark is to the first mark. You can see where it is, it's down there. Okay, so we've got to come up a bit more. Spot on. And now we've got to go slightly to the right. A little bit more. And down just a shade. 
OK. So let's start the whole process again and see how good we are this second iteration. Here we are, close up again to mirror two, target. Beep. Not bad. It's not far off centre, is it? Just a shade low. <clears throat> let's move away. We're not worried about the position at the moment. What we're interested in doing is to get the two marks to coincide. That's important at the moment. So we're now in the distant position and we'll try a pulse. Slightly too much. And then we've got to come up a shade. And there we go. Now I think we've done it. We've got perfect coincidence. So we'll do that one more time to prove it. Here we go. Target. Pulse. Perfect. Pulse. OK, so we've now got this beam running perfectly true to this x-axis, like this. And it's perfectly true to the x-axis, like this. Otherwise those two would not be sitting on top of each other. All right. That's the critical thing. Now once you've achieved that, then what we've got to do is to get the beam on the centre of our crosshair. And we do that, we just, we've got to lift the head up just to catch the beam right in the centre of that crosshair. And there we go. So we can't ask for much better than that. So that's got our beam hopefully pointing at the true centre of our mirror. And if we like to look carefully, we can see in there that the mirror is nice and easily available for cleaning. I'm not going to clean it because I've only recently cleaned that mirror. Now, what I'm going to do now is to remove the lens. Like that. Now here I've got a second setting piece which I'm going to drop into this slot at the bottom here. When I push that in properly, like that, that's going to give me another receptacle to receive a target, like that. So now we've set mirror two, we can't do anything further with mirror two, and we're now working on mirror three. Now the same principles apply to mirror three that applied to mirror one and mirror two. We're going to use one of these positions and it doesn't matter which, okay, which is fairly close to the mirror. And what we'll do, we'll see how close this mirror is to putting the beam right down the centre of this hole. It doesn't matter where we are in the X stroke now because we've already set the X axis up. So we can be anywhere convenient to do this. So let's check. You can see through the side of this one very nicely, conveniently, because I've made it of clear acrylic. Because it's the only material I've got to work with. If this works, I may possibly make one out of anodised aluminium. And there we go, look. There's our dot. So we know that it's approximately in the right place. Right, so what we're now going to do is try and set up the z-axis. We've established that the beam is in roughly the right place. Not the right place, not the perfect place, but it's in approximately the right place. And so we're now going to check that this axis moves up and down, down the axis of our beam. So we're going to set our beam true to the z-axis now. We don't have a bearing for the z-axis, but what we have got is four of these lead screws on each corner which basically take the table up and down in basically, it takes the table up and down in a Z motion. Fairly true. I say fairly true, it depends on how good your table is. But this particular table, I've set it so that it's, I've tightened things up and adjusted things so that it's pretty good. Now we're going to go through exactly the same process as we did for the X and the Y axis. We're going to make a target burn. Now that target burn doesn't have to be perfect, we just have to have a burn on that piece of paper there. So there we go. And now we're going to drop the table by about four or five inches 
tedious process, the further away it is, the more accurate you'll get your Z. OK. So now we'll do a second pulse burn. Now that's not bad. It's slightly out of position and we can see which way it's got to go. And this time my adjustments are done, not with thumb screws, but with a key. Because I've made these so that they're nice and easy to adjust with a key. They work exactly the same as the other mirrors do now. If I want to move the beam forward, I've got to tip the mirror backwards. And to do that, I've got to let a little bit of slack off of this one. And there we go. And then if I want it to go across that way, I've got to let a little bit of slack off this one. So I've got to let the mirror come back on that corner. And there we go. So I reckon that's not bad. So we've got to go through that same process again. OK, that's close enough, three or four mil. Line it up like that and do a pulse. Beep. One more. There we go. Then we drop it down. Still slightly over this way. So we've got to go just a shade more to the back of the machine. That's the hinge there, look, remember? And so to get it towards the back of the machine, we need to adjust this one. And we've got to basically let the, let the mirror go that way. So we've got to let a little bit more off. And there we go. And I reckon that's just about it. So now what we've done, we've set the Z axis absolutely true to the table. So as the table goes down, the top and the bottom positions are perfectly in line. Again, everything's nicely lined up now, so it doesn't matter which position we do this test in. It's a nice home position. We drop the target in. We're slightly off. Now it might be a little bit, but this is the most important axis of them all. To get things more or less in the right position, we set this head so that the beam was true to my front target. Front target was fine. It got us into the right place nearly, as you can see. But this is not good enough. So we're now going to transfer our effort away from this front target to this second target. Now what we've got to do is to move this head up and down so that the beam strikes the mirror in a slightly different place. So dropping it by two millimetres is not going to give us a big issue. So I can keep an eye on this little step at the top here and we can drop it by about two millimetres. And now you can see why it's very important to have this head adjustable because if you don't have this head adjustable the only thing that you've got to play with to do this is the, is the tube at the back there and you've got to keep going all the way back adjusting the tube up and down and resetting the machine. You don't want to go back and keep resetting the machine, you just want to work forwards and stay forwards. I won't tighten up too much and we'll see what we've done. Too much. You see how we've brought it forward by just dropping the head down? Okay, so now we've got to take it up just a shade. One more little tweak and I think that's pretty good. So let's just put a new target in there. I think that looks pretty good. So we we'll just check that one more time. You can never be too fussy about this final piece of setting. This is the piece that has to be as accurate as you can possibly get it. So we we'll just set that crosshair right and we'll do a... That looks pretty good. We haven't messed around with the mirror, remember? So our axis is still perfectly true. The only thing that we've played with is the position of the mirror in space, up and down and in and out, to catch the beam on this target. So we caught the beam here to start with, and then we discounted that and we did the more important one, which is catching the beam here. This ensures that the beam is going right down the axis of the lens. And that's the critical thing about all of this setting, going down the central point of the lens. 
So now I'm going to do one final test which should prove everything that we've just done. So here we are, front right corner, pulse, pulse, back left corner, pulse. Pulse. Right. So there's something not quite right because they are very slightly out in those four positions. Now careful as we were, so this front position here is there and the back position is slightly out. Now the only thing that's changed is the y-axis. So the error between these two positions must be the y-axis. So despite us being careful, we didn't quite set the y-axis up as good as it should be. Now it's only very slightly out, but only very slightly is really a bit too much for me. So what we should need to do is go back and look at the y-axis mirror number one because that's where the problem possibly lies. But we're slightly, if anything, look, we're slightly to the right and that could be our problem. So that means we've got to bring the burn slightly to the left and maybe slightly up. Let's try it one more time because you've seen how crucial it is to get this these axes absolutely spot on. Now, as I keep emphasizing to people it's not essential to have your beam perfectly in the center. It is important that you have the two front and back positions absolutely spot on top of each other. I think I've got to live with that and we'll go back and do the final test again. Okay let's see what we've done now. Well we certainly changed the position but let's not get worried we need to make sure that we get the back position the same. And there we go, spot on. We're now going to check the two X positions. We saw that the two positions in Y were good, so we'll now see how good we are in X. <clears throat> so we do a pulse here, and then we'll run across to the other end of the X, and we'll see how far we are out in X. Very slightly. So I think we'd better go back and just check X again as well. <clears throat> so all four corners are now pretty good. But what we have got to do is we've got to reset the position of the head because it's no longer on centre. At this time we've got to move the beam back here. And to get the beam to move back we've got to move the head up. And the front corner. There we go, four corners, spot on, all the way around the machine. So we've now got X, Y and Z set perfectly. And at this point, we can be confident when we put a lens in that the beam is going to pass down through the center of the lens. So we just dropped my lens system back in. This is a one and a half inch lens, by the way. And I then have to hook up the air assist on the lens. Lots of air, as you can hear. I want to turn that down. Okay, now air assist is a completely different subject which we will tackle in a future session. This is a long session anyway, but we will just prove the point 
that everything's working okay. We'll just clear the rubbish away. Now this is a piece of 10 millimeter soft, I believe it's pine plywood. So what I have to do now is to set the focus up to the suitable position, which I believe for this lens, and I haven't really tested this lens very much, I believe, no, maybe five millimeters. reach the critical point. It's come out nicely. We've got a lovely brown edge on there, not a charred edge. And the edges are reasonably square actually, they're pretty good. Now the real test for me of whether we've got the cut about as fast as we can go is when we wipe it on a tissue do we get, deb do we get carbon? just the merest hint. Trust me, if that was terrible, that would be really black. There's virtually nothing coming off of that surface there. The terrible thing about cutting wood, as you can see, is all the tar that's produced from the smoke. That's the smoke. That's this stuff running onto the top of your cut. You don't want any smoke coming up. You want it all going down. And because this is a cold surface, that smoke condenses and that's what you've got there, a sticky tar. And that's what would fill your honeycomb table and you would not be able to get rid of it. And after three years, nearly three years of cutting wood, perspex, all sorts of things on there, my table still remains clean because with just a little bit of acetone, as soon as the job is finished, You can't do that with a honeycomb table, can you? Okay, now I've purposely not been showing you too much about the lens assembly itself. Now that we've completed our setup and test of the head, um, I can show you how easily it is to change the lenses. We've got this little plate here, which unplugs. We need to disconnect the little tubular air assist which plugs into a little hole on the side there. To swap the lens over, all we're going to do is literally just drop this little module in. Now the lens itself is sitting on the top there, retained by an O-ring. And when we put air assist on the bottom, there's sufficient area across the top there to just pop that O-ring and the lens out. But what we're going to do, we're going to captivate the lens and the tube assembly and push it back into its little registration at the back there with this little plate. And that little plate clips in the slots at the back. As we clamp it down, we're compressing the O-ring and we're locking the whole thing in. So it's not gonna come out with any motion. And you can see exactly what's going on in there. We have to just plug in our air assist tube. Like that. It's just, a, just a, a very slight interference push fit in there. Now we can make this tube whatever shape we like. Um, this is just a piece of four millimeter tube that sits inside this standard piece of six millimeter tube that comes with the machine. So that's the way that we change the lenses. It's as simple as that. We've got a whole set of lenses there. The point being that this dimension here is virtually always the same. It's going to be five or six millimeters of distance between the end of the nozzle and the work. Now you'll also notice that every one of these lenses has got a very very small hole in it. It's a two and a half millimeter hole so we get lots of directed airflow if we want to do cutting. If we don't want to do cutting then we just turn the air down to virtually nothing and we shall just get a trickle, a safe trickle to protect the lens. Well I hope that all makes perfect sense to you. I'm pleased with the way in which it's come out. Um, it all seems to be working exactly to plan and so consequently I shall leave this head on here 
I may even have a go at trying to increase the accelerations and speeds on here now because the mass of this head compared to the mass of this head is huge. The other thing that of course is a major difference is something that I call the pendulum effect. It's this effect here. You know, you don't need very much error down here to be a long way out. It also makes this lens a long way away from this mirror very sensitive to slight imperfections in the alignment of this mirror. So you don't need very much change in the position of the beam onto that mirror to cause a major change to the angle of this beam hitting your lens. I've tried to deal with most of the potential issues that you get with these machines. But you will know in future whether or not this is successful because it will either be there forever or this will make a return. Thanks for your time and I'll catch up with you in another session.